right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. Wow, we got a full house here at the Stoa today. Um, and season four of the Stoa actually starts today. The Stoa's birthday was last Tuesday, and uh, we could not have a better session to start us off. Uh, today's title uh, is At Work in the Ruins at the Stoa. And this will be a conversation about endings uh, and the death phobia that is at the heart of modernity. But it will also be about uh, beginnings and how we can reimagine the sources of agency uh, when bringing forth something new. Uh, and we have four guests joining us today, and I will introduce them now. I'll be letting uh, people in the, the room throughout. Um, so we have uh, Dugold Hind. Uh, Dugold is a social thinker and co-founder of the Dark Mountain uh, Project in a school called Home. And his new book, uh, At Work in the Ruins, Finding Our Place in the Time of Science, Climate Change, Pandemics, and All Other Emergencies, came out last month. And uh, today's session is based on the, the themes of this uh, book. Uh, and this is uh, Dugald's second time visiting the Stoa. Uh, next up, we have uh, uh, Bio Akamalafe. Uh, Bio is a speaker, teacher, uh, and trans public intellectual. And he's the author of two books, uh, including These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, a letter to my daughter on humanity's search for home. Uh, and this is Bio's, also Bio's second time uh, at the Stoa. Uh, and we have Stephen Jenkinson. Stephen is a teacher, storyteller, spiritual activist, and founder of the Orphan uh, Wisdom School. Uh, he's written numerous books, including his new one, which just came in the mail uh, for me, uh, Reckoning. Uh, and this is Stephen's uh, fifth time or sixth time at the, at the Stoa. I, I can't remember. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Vanessa uh, Andret, uh, and Andriotti. Um, uh, Vanessa is a professor at the University of British Columbia, and she's one of the founding members of Gesturing to Colonial Futures Collective, which I'm a, a big fan of. We had a session with them uh, a few years ago. And uh, she's the author of uh, Hospicing Modernity, Facing Humanity's Wrongs and the Implications of Social Activism. And this is Vanessa's uh, first time at the STOA. And if I mispronounce anyone's name, please uh, please correct me when the, when you're up. Um, and before I set up uh, today's session, I'm going to hand over to uh, the Stoa to uh, Dugold. Um, and if you have any opening words, uh, my friend, feel free to do so. And I believe you have a passage you'd like to read uh, from the book. Well, thank you, Peter, for making us welcome at the Stoa. What a delight to be able to bring together this combination of people in little boxes on our screens and I'm thinking both of you know how honored I am to have Vanessa and Stephen and Bio joining in a conversation around this book because it's a book that owes a real debt to each of you and I'm also looking out and seeing old friends and um, people who I know from around the long table at our little school here and um, names that are familiar to me, but that I've never put faces to among the crowd. So thank you all for, for showing up whatever time of day it is with you. So, yeah, I thought just to, to set the scene for tonight, I would read you a page or two from... This is from the the end of the, um, it's not really called an introduction. The book just starts with this text, which is called, First There Must Be an End. And this is the last part of that text, the part that explains itself a little and, uh, and maybe begins to, to set up some of the currents running between us, um, the four of us who are bringing our voices to, to weaving this session with you all tonight. In these times, all we can do is be a sign. A father tells his daughter in Ben Okri's novel, The Freedom Artist. We have to help to bring about the end of the world. We must do this, he goes on, so that a new beginning can come. But first, there must be an end. It matters which world we think is ending. And it matters what we tell each other is worth doing, 
in such a time. Among the people we meet in the story I tell in the pages ahead are those who have dedicated their lives to the study of climate science. Those taking desperate measures as activists to break the trance they see around them. And those inside existing institutions who have been shaken to the core by what we know and what we have good grounds to fear about the trouble in which we find ourselves. There can be a danger in allowing that trouble to be defined solely in terms of climate change. But I'm convinced of the importance of each of these roles in these times. I'm also convinced that other roles need playing and other kinds of action are called for. There's a lot to be unfolded along the way, but let's have some leads to get us started, taken from a few of those who have helped to shape my thinking. First, there must be an end, but many kinds of end are possible. My friend Vanessa Machado de Oliveira wrote a book called Hospicing Modernity. The title invites us to a kind of work in which the focus is not on saving modernity or bringing it down or rushing to build what comes afterwards, but doing what we can to give it a good ending, to let it hand on its gifts and teach the lessons that may only become apparent as the end approaches. It may seem like this book is trying to kill or destroy modernity by announcing its death, she writes, but this is something no book can do. It's a warning that applies to my book too. No one I've met has more to offer by way of tools for the work of hospicing, but the way Vanessa tells it, this must be accompanied by a work of midwifery, assisting with the birth of something new, unfamiliar, and possibly, but not necessarily, wiser, and avoiding suffocating this new world with our projections. The philosopher Federico Campagna speaks about living at the end of a world. In such a time, he suggests, the work is no longer to concern ourselves with making sense, according to the logic of the world that is ending, but to leave good ruins, clues, and starting points for those who come after, that they may use in building a world that is, as Vanessa would say, presently unimaginable. They may be here already, the builders of that world. Some of them may have been here all along, inhabiting the ruins made by the world of the powerful. The anthropologist Anna Lonehaup Singh wrote a book called The Mushroom at the End of the World, on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins. That could be a role to take in times like these, to go looking for possibilities of life among the ruins around and ahead of us. I don't write to announce the end of the world or to change the minds of those who are convinced that the world as we have known it can be saved or made sustainable. I write for anyone who has found themselves as I have needing to make sense of what is ending, how we can talk about it, and what tasks are worth taking on in whatever time it turns out that we have. Something is coming over the horizon, a humbling from which none of us will be spared, that will not be managed or controlled, but will leave us change. Before it is over, I suspect, we will need to learn again what it means to take seriously things that are larger or smaller than were allowed to be real or significant, according to the scales and systems of modernity. We will need to dance again with the rhythms of cosmology, to be carried by the kind of stories and images in whose company, as the mythographer Martin Shaw would say, a universe becomes a cosmos. We will need to remember that we are not alone and never were, that we are part of a world of many worlds, only some of which are human. And we will need to rediscover that any world worth living for centers not on the vast systems we built to secure the future, but on those encounters that are proportioned to the kind of creatures we are, the places where we meet, the acts of friendship, 
and the acts of hospitality in which we offer shelter and kindness to the stranger at the door. In this way, even now, there may be time to find our place within the vastly larger and older story of which we always were a part. So that's the sign over the door on the way into the book. That's the, whether you take it as a blessing or as something else, that's uh, the words that are pronounced as you cross the threshold. So thank you again for joining us tonight. I'm gonna hand back to Peter and I'm gonna look forward to, to hearing how the conversation flows between my friends here and all of you and joining in again at some point along the way. So good. Um, and this is going to be a good conversation. So buckle up, everyone. And um, at this point, if everyone could uh, turn off their camera, um, except the, the four guests, and you will we'll be turning them on uh, during the Q&A portion, just adds uh, intimacy here at the STOA and uh, helps with the camera. And I'll, I'll highlight the, the speaker screen in a moment. But how today is going to work is uh, uh, each panelist will, will take about five minutes to answer uh, an opening question um, and then a free associative kind of a conversation will happen uh, for about uh, 45 uh, to 60 minutes and then we'll have a 20 to 30 minute Q&A hopefully we'll sneak in at least one or two questions and then the question is this uh, how do we find the work worth doing in a time of endings and where do we look for the signs that something else might be uh, might be being born even now um, and then the order uh, will be uh, Bio, then Stephen, then Vanessa, then Dugold. Uh, so uh, Bio, when you go, then when you finish taking Stephen, then Stephen takes and Vanessa, then Vanessa taking uh, Dugold, and Dugold then just open up the, the space. Uh, and then after uh, 45, 60 minutes, I'll pop my camera on, that'll be sign that uh, we'll, we'll drift to the uh, Q&A portion. Um, so that being said, uh, Bio. I'm taking you in. <laughs> I was like, why would you start with me? Come on, why would you start with me? Uh, wonderful, brother, hearing you over and over again. Um, and it's good to be here. I greet everyone. Um, and my friends, my dear sister Vanessa, Stephen, I'm meeting for the first time. This is a good beginning. Um, and Dougal, as always. Um, I think endings are collaborative events. Um, endings are multi-species arrangements. Um, there's a story of endings and beginnings that has been... Beginnings that has been... I'm hearing myself, which is nice, but I, I'm not sure I like to do that. Um, <laughs> where was I? There was a story of endings and beginnings that has been told by way of modern civilization, by way of capitalist imaginaries, the idea that beginnings are these are are pure events, so to speak, and endings are likewise pure events um, enacted by independent selves, so to speak, or matters of independence, right? right. Uh, but, there, but there is a sense, and I really loved what Ben Okri, how you quoted Ben Okri, um, Dougald, um, that we have to create endings. There is a we, a thick we, that is not necessarily an anthropocentric human we. There is a thick we that invites us to notice that endings are, are ecological matters. They are matters of porosity. When bodies meet other bodies differently, when postures and patterns and algorithms and stories are told differently. 
so that endings are not the abruptness of things. They, 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 it's not about some cutting off of continuity. It's about transversals. It's about something crossing through what the Yorubas will call the crossroads, right? It's a richer, denser, thicker cosmology at work um, or that is invited when we consider endings differently. I'm thinking about all the ruins in our bodies, right? Um, the liberal traditional notion of, of purpose and endings and beginnings would consider that our bodies as entirely purposeful, right? Our bodies are uh, these instrumental organic things, machines. Um, but our bodies are replete. They're full with endings everywhere, right? Vestigial organs, the appendix, uh, the auricular muscles, which we don't use anymore. It's like there are ruins everywhere. And we have learned to see bodies as this uniform entities. I feel these are the moments when we're realizing that we've always lived with endings. It's right here in our bodies. We've always been part of endings and new beginnings. And the invitation of our time is to stay with the endings that want to materialize now, right? Um, so matters of worth, how we come to understand what is worthwhile now, we are not gonna unilaterally decide this. This is not gonna be a matter of manifestos or independent analysis of the cold rationalities of modern civilization. This will be, this will only be faintly glimpsed in spaces of deep encounter where we are exceeded by a world that we have over time cast in positions of secondary worthiness, if you will. Now we are witnessing an insurgency of the invisible. It's in the place where our bodies interact with the invisible that we will learn what is worth doing, what is beautiful, what is true, what is purposeful, and what is not anew, right? Um, I, I might just add this, that you probably know about the IPCC report that was released on, was it Monday, last week, Monday? I think March 21st, March 20th or 21st. And it's a document, it's this story at the heart of modern civilization that clings to hope, right? It's, it's almost like a Pandoran box. It wants to hope that there's something we can do as we write our last fonts of human agency could you guys please do something? This is scientists passing it over to policymakers, right? Could you do something about this crisis? It's a, it's a document that is um, desperate and anxious. And the UN Secretary General uh, speaking about it said, this is a um, how-to guide for how to defuse the climate time bomb, right? And I remember thinking, and this has come up in conversation with my own friends, I remember thinking to myself, but the bomb went off a long time ago. <laughs> this is not about something that is yet to happen. This is not die hard, right? This is not some movie script where we rush in and save the day. We are living in the midst of the explosion. We are already part of these endings, right? And living here, in a space that is, in a world that no longer can sit still or abide faithful to the mythologies of human supremacy, we need new frameworks with which to think fruitfully about loss and about death. We need new ways of thinking death and endings that does not cohere or coincide with notions of industrial continuity. We need, we need new ways of thinking about death that allows us to think of it as collaborative events. Um, yeah, let me stop there.
and past the, uh, what am I passing to you, Stephen? <laughs> gourd. Okay, the gourd to, to Stephen. Okay, very good. Well, first of all, I'm very, I'm just impressed and, and a little bit uh, stymied and awed that I don't know how I fit in with the august company I find myself in the midst of, but I'll do a good job of impersonating somebody who belongs, or I'll try. I was lucky, in, well, two things. One is um, I was lucky enough to have a school not that long ago when people could still travel reasonably freely, and of course those days properly have been called into disrepute, thankfully, and so my school has suffered accordingly, and probably that's that's not as, as it is as it should be. But in the school, I've, I was lucky enough to come five or six or, oh man, 10 or 12 times to the oldest book that the uh, Anglo-Saxon speaking people uh, bequested to us. Um, it's, it's the mothership of the language we're all speaking in right now. And there's a scene, it's, it's poorly called Beowulf, by the way, but it's not clear that Beowulf is actually the center of attention, certainly not the purposeful center of attention. Uh, because there's a uh, there's a moment that passes by most uh, critical uh, approaches to the story. There's a moment there where Grendel has come down on the mist bands from the from the heights, and he's uh, much aggrieved. Subsequent events suggest to you that he's much aggrieved because of the dismembering of his mother. But prior to that. There's something else. He comes to the door of the mead hall, it says. And there's a, I wish I could give you the Anglo-Saxon word. I've forgotten what it is right now. But there's a moment when it's clear from subsequent events that he could trash the joint, knock through every door, penetrate as he, as he sees fit, and subsequently does so. But there's a moment that it's not hesitation, where he's not trying to get his facts in order or trying to prevail. He actually touches the door, on the other side of which is all the merriment and all the humans having their way with themselves and with each other. And in this moment, it's clear that the, the gesture of the, that he makes is one of supplication and a pleading to be allowed in. That's all. Just a seat at the table. That's all. Not the table, not everybody around it, not everything just a place, and by virtue of their merriment or whatever else distracted them, nobody hears the sound. And as a consequence of not hearing the sound, the door rips from its hinges and the story is off and running, sadly. I don't know where in that story we are with what Bios described. I really, I genuinely don't know. It looks like I've been around perhaps a couple of years old, more than the rest of you. I don't know that there's any particular benefit to that. But uh, it just, even with a few more years, it's, it's not clear at all that we're at the point where somehow the real powers that be are simply touching the door with some kind of plea, even at the 11th hour, to have it, their place among us. The other story comes from the death trade. I worked in the death trade, and I saw a lot of people unto their endings. And I don't know if this is useful to you or not, but I'd make a distinction between endings and demises. And this is the reason why. Everybody died in the metabolic sense of the term on my watch. Everybody who came to my attention perished accordingly. And yet most of them spent their dying time not dying by any serious understanding of the term, they weren't dying while they died. And I mean that to sound strangely confounding, because it was confounding. Um, and it just brings you to the term loss, which has showed up already in the intro and so on. This was the most employed synonym for die in the death trade. By far, it outstripped all the other ones. And I was brought to, uh, to the following comparison. 
I thought to myself, and subsequently have used this image a lot. Anyone in this room ever lost their wallet? And typically there's at least a handful of people who've done so. And I said, um, how'd you feel about yourself when you did, did that? And, you know, people signal the obvious uh, low-grade distress or high-grade distress, depending on what they lost. Anybody in this room ever lost their car keys? A lot of hands go up. How do you, and often they're the same hands, I should point out. And um, how'd you feel about yourself then? And the degree of self-hatred, of course, ratchets up accordingly. And the third question in the triumvirate is, anybody here ever lost their mother, their father, sister, brother, and so on? And the hands will go up more or less automatically in the same, much the same way the other two did. Without any hesitation, I was actually trying to introduce hesitation in the, into the automata of the thing. Because I'm employing the same word, allegedly, as if it's the same word iterated three times. But I'm suggesting to you that it's far from the truth that people had an obligation to lose someone simply because they had died. After all, at least in the language I'm speaking in now, dying is what you do, and being killed is what happens to you. One. And two, um, you can die from among us without the surrogate situation of disappearance, without a trace. This was dying people's greatest terror. It wasn't the dying, it wasn't the mechanics, nor the bioethics of the machinery. It was disappearing without a trace and the rest of us being able to conduct ourselves as if they'd never been. So I'm not sure that what we're imagining here, I think, have I got a minute? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that we're imagining here is, is really properly understood as death if we continue to use the word ending as a, as a synonym. Dying is, is, uh, is, in English, it's an active verb. And uh, I guess I'm not sure myself whether the operation is dying or whether it's in swoon. Okay. Uh, next. I've forgotten who's next. Sorry. There you go. Over to you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Bye, you and Dugo. I'm now in a state of contemplation. It's very hard to get out because all that I've heard now gave me so much to think about. I would like to spend the day not talking, just, just sitting with things. Um, but I have, yeah, I need to talk. So um, the way that the only response that's coming to me at this point, and I'm still wrestling with the difference between dying and being killed in my mind, is the difficulties that people have of staying with the death process and how unprepared, unequipped we are within modernity to do that. Perhaps modernity itself was created to avoid death, to destroy the possibility of death. And that's why we have so, so uh, much difficulty with staying with the death process. And, and there is, um, I work in institutions uh, that are also dying and that are facing um, the, the, the wider meta death of the system as well. And what you see is what, what Dugo has already described in terms of people either trying to save it or trying to bring it down or trying to uh, rush towards building something else. And it's very difficult to sit with the process of death itself and try to offer a good death. So one of the things we're doing as part of a, a program of, of different things we're trying out, different experiments, is to work with engineers um, and to offer them, a, because they are at the forefront of uh, the solutions, right? The solutionism, but also of trying to address this problem and using a lot of time and resources of the disciplines of, of, of STEM and but particularly engineering. And one of the things we are trying to do is to bring, bring in ideas that are coming from the Amazon, from Chief Ninawa Honikui of the Honikui people, who talks about um, <clears throat> colonialism being a neurobiological impairment, 
that affects the ways we think, we feel, and then the possibilities of relationships uh, and relationship building we have. And as a neurobiological impairment, if it affects the way we relate to our own selves, to each other, to the land, to the planet as a whole. And it needs to be addressed as such, as a neurobiological impairment. And he talks about Western science uh, and technology being uh, advanced in terms of engineering uh, that is often used uh, in the direction of exploitation, expropriation, and um, um, uh, destruction um, of, of, of everything. But Nina you know, talks also about the relational sciences and technologies that um, indigenous groups uh, everywhere have had to maintain with what's visible and invisible uh, of the metabolism we're all part, uh, part of. So we, we, we try to present to the engineers the idea that they have not been exposed to relational sciences and technologies through their modern education, modern colonial education. And one of the exercises we do um, to, to try to illustrate that is to take these engineers through the spectrum of emotions as you approach the problem of climate destabilization and biodiversity apocalypse. So we put this in, so everybody is around in a circle, we put the climate destabilization and biodiversity uh, apocalypse symbolically in the middle of the room. And we ask people to identify uh, a response, a relational response uh, to, the, to the problem. Actually, we have eight relational responses that we take them through. First, as a way of thinking, and then we bring it to the body. We identify it in the body. We do some of this work, but I'm, I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to talk about the, the spectrum of responses. And the first one, um, the response to uh, the climate and nature emergency would be one of certainty, where you're looking for certainty. And you're looking for uh, the certainty in solutions, in, in sorting out the problem, in finding the formula or the universal answer that is going to, to take us to where we want to go. And there is dopamine involved. There's also the status uh, that you will get with your peers involved. And there, there's a lot of um, personal investment in that kind of response. So that's the first response. The second one, the second kind of certainty is the certainty that we're all gonna die. And that this is gonna be a shit show that there's no way we can survive um, what's gonna unfold. And that certainty also gives you something. Uh, it is. It's. It can be seen also as an escape from the uncertainty of it all. So, the uh, third uh, emotional response uh, or affective landscape of response is the response of defensiveness. Then, once once your certainty has been um, challenged effectively, because otherwise you just ignore it, you would have a defensive response to. Uh, there not being certainties, and you would feel um, angry. So that it is a cortisol and adrenaline induced response. The fourth response is one of confusion when you actually understand that some of the certainties you had before are actually bullshit, and but you you can't actually. <laughs> let go of them very easily, and you don't want to be in a state of uncertainty. And that confusion sometimes creates nausea and a lot of discombobulation that people are not really, th that's the state that people try to avoid in escaping to an idealization in order to avoid that state. Then we talk about pause, where you actually take stock and take time to understand your <laughs> affective and cognitive landscape in relationship to what's in the room and, and, and what's on, on the table. And you can see and read the room in a different way and you can read yourself in a different way, but you're not yet engaging because you're taking the time to prepare to engage. The next one is individual curiosity, where is, you try to approach uh, the issue from a very different chemistry actually, but trying to, um, maybe understand it through self-actualization, trying to see the different uh, layers of the problem. You're not a 
any more afraid of the complexity of the issue. You're engaging with the paradoxes uh, and you're trying to act where you uh, feel you can have a contribution. Then there is the state of accountable curiosity that can only happen when you're doing the, the inquiry and the experiments together. And that's where we stop a little bit for the engineers to talk about the, uh, the joy you find in epiphany and in collective epiphany, in working together through successes and failures. Success is a yay. Failure might be a yay, yay after a while once you process the, uh, the lessons from that failure. And we try to engage them in that uh, possibility of a chemical <laughs> reaction to the problem that is not based on certainty. But we also introduce the last one, which is a space of presencing climate uh, destabilization and biodiversity loss from um, <clears throat> a relational space that we are not trained to be in, which is what Nina Lai is talking about, Chief Nina Lai is talking about. In this space, you look at climate change and climate change looks at you. You see the temperatures rising, the floods, the fires, the famine happening around you, but also within you. And that's the space where I think when I heard uh, Bio talking about the witnessing of the insurgence of the invisible can happen. But we also talk about the fact that we can't because we, ha we're, we have not been trained in this science and technology. We cannot just uh, appropriate <laughs> other people's science and technology and bring it here. It is important that the science and tech, the relational science and technology of Western society emerges from Western society growing up and maturing in its relationship with the world and, and, and maybe transcends the sense, the imposed sense of separability that has created the neurobiological impairment. So we have a lot of exercises that go in that direction to help people think through how. Uh, what, like what they're missing out on, what other possibilities uh, of existence and coexistence are already viable, but unintelligible or unimaginable within our conditioned ways of being, of thinking, of imagining, and of hoping. So I think I'll stop there <laughs> and, and, and go back to my, <laughs> my contemplation of the other questions that you ha have kindly offered me. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, Vanessa. Yeah. I want to just be with that invitation to contemplation for a moment. And that was the first time I've heard you describe that map or process that you've been working with, with the engineers but I was very struck that it begins with this uh, certainty because one of the places I get to at the end of the book after wandering in a lot of different directions and spending quite a lot of time thinking about death and the ways that our relations to death obscure or muddle our ability to think about the trouble we're in when it comes to climate change or or the pandemic for that matter. By the end, I'm describing some strange encounters that I began to have with people who were, you know, I had spent years being called a doomer because Paul and I had written the Dark Mountain Manifesto. And then suddenly around 2018, I started to encounter people often deep inside national or international institutions who had arrived at a kind of place of black certainty, bleak certainty, knowing how the story ends, that was a form of pessimism that was utterly other than anything I'd ever met amongst the, the range of souls who showed up in different ways to Dark Mountain. And it took me quite a while to fathom this. And in a way, I had to write this book in order to, to reckon with the strangeness of some of those encounters. Um, 
And what I came to see was that for a lot of the people I was encountering in those, those settings, it was as though they had, had lost faith in the institutions that they had spent their lives working inside. So they no longer believed in the promises, the promise that we can save the world, and fix climate change and build a sustainable future. And I'm sure everyone here could add to the list of promises or slogans, mm. but they hadn't questioned the theology of the faith that they had lost. They still thought of the world as a thing in need of saving. And by people like them sitting in offices like theirs, and therefore, if they could no longer conceive of that happening, that meant they knew how everything ends. And, you know, really, one of my hopes for the book is that it helps us find ways to make invitations to people who are stuck in that place. And I often see them cycling between a kind of, and I, I recognize it in myself. You know, I'm not describing this as something utterly strange and alien. The patterns echo backwards and forwards. And part of why I had to write about this was because of how powerfully I found myself being drawn into these cycles in spending time together. But there was a kind of cycling between a flat despair and a desperate optimism which was all kind of still trapped inside this, the kind of ghost of the, the theology, the ghost of the faith that their institutions still professed to represent. And oh, what I think, what I think is lacking there is or rather what the the invitation maybe that is that is needed there and that's what i hear you developing in the process that you're taking these groups with engineers through vanessa is a broadening or an unsettling of the assumptions about agency you know because that that faith assigns all of the agency not just to the humans but to a particular subset of humans, the ones who are identified by modernity as the people who live closest to the future, the brightest and the best, and the, the ones who prosper within the systems through which um, credentials and power and authority have been given out around here lately. And you know, just to awaken that, I can't remember quite the phrase you used, Bio, but it was this sense that at most what we get are these kind of glimmering hints of how something beyond the thing that can preoccupy our attention as the ending of everything. It's kind of little glimpses that there might be more to the story than we can see from where we're sitting or standing mm -hmm. and that you know, to the extent that people will look back and go oh there were the things that turned out to be the things that made the difference in these times it'll only be from a very different place in time and space and relationship that those things come into view and probably they won't come from the people who were assigned agency according to the logic of the, the world that was ending and the places that are assumed to, to be located in closest proximity to the future and therefore are going to be the distribution centers from which everyone else is sooner or later going to get their, uh, their solutions there. So, yeah, I guess if I'm throwing this back now to the three of you, I'm curious to hear a little more about 
those encounters that have given you pause, whether they're, you know, like the ones that I was talking about there, encounters that happen close to the places that are marked as the center, the centers of power and modernity and, you know, the places the solutions come from, or encounters that are happening in places that are marked as the edges or just not marked on the maps that we're often given to steer by that that might contain clues that that the story is not as simple as we often find ourselves telling it mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. that's what i'm curious to mm -hmm. to hear so i don't know who would like to to pick up and run with that a little I can say a few things uh, around that. Um, obviously, I'm um, I'm writing a an essay now that is a conceptual twin sibling to your work, Dougald mm. and Vanessa's in that mapping trajectory, and Stevens in noticing that um, there is a verb there is a verb or there's an actioning when where death is concerned, that maybe death is too abrupt uh, conceptualization, it's dying. Um, I called that essay, or I call it, it's not been released yet, it's, let's not save the planet. And it derives from a vision of, of the architectural um, additions made to slave ships in order to protect the slave from drowning, right? Uh, that, of course, in traveling six to eight weeks across the Atlantic Ocean, um, these stolen bodies would seek to end their lives. And so they would want to jump into the water. But you see that uh, their masters cared for their safety. So they built these nets around the ships to catch the slaves. And I'm thinking about how, in some sense, safety can become safety and predictability and what Vanessa is naming as certainty can become this insidious reproduction of the familiar, even with our best attempts to, to address what feels like a crippling crisis. Um, so I've been staying with ants as a good choir boy, listening to Solomon, who um, cautions that Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Of course, none of you know your Bible. <laughs> but, but it's in the Bible, somewhere in Proverbs. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. And there's a phenomenon called the ant death spiral. I don't know if you know of, of it, Dougald. Vanessa? Stephen? Um, it's called ant milling. And it's a death spiral. And it's something to do with pheromones course, and pheromonic trails, and um, the blindness of army ants. Thanks, Peter, for everyone to see ant mills. Um, the phenomenon is such that um, something happens, and the ants start to go around in circles. They're trapped in some kind of sensorial monoculture. And their bodies just secrete pheromones to each other because they can't see. And they keep going around and around and around in circles. Eventually, they get exhausted and they die right there. And think about being in that trail. Um, they're telling themselves just the next turn, we're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. It's like NASCAR and steroids. Is that the right <laughs> metaphor, NASCAR? They keep going round and round and round, and they just die there. And I've been considering, you know, questions around what would it take for a break to happen? 
because it's almost impossible for them to break away from that pheromonic territory. What would it take for a break to happen, to see differently? Um, and which leads me to another uh, noticing around ants that they are often infected by fungi, by, mm. by, the, by fungi. The fungus Codiceps is famous for infecting ants and insects in general. But it is with that infection, that bodily pairing with another sensorial apparatus that a drift happens, that they break away from that colonizing circle. It's almost like the world is inviting infection, that we are in some anthro milling process. We're, we're stuck. And it would take a strain away of some kind to enact emancipatory promises of the otherwise, the non-legibility of a politics that's not predicated on listing out the things that I will do for you if only you vote for me, right? It's unspeakable. And this non-description, this fugitive idea is, is, is exactly what we're leaning against. We're leaning against the fence of a different cosmology and we're not invited to describe it because of its non-textuality, we're being invited to stay with the, the trouble of it, the hint of it, a glimpse of it. So when you ask me, brother, what, what event or what have you come across or what, it, it, it's not a big thing for me. It's not some neurotypical giant organizing process that I've stayed with. It's my son. I keep on coming back to the prophetic grip of my son as a response to climate chaos as a response to our stockness, because my son on the autistic spectrum also enacts that strain away mm. from carceral pathways. And this is the reason I speak about an autistic politics. This is the reason I feel that the universe proliferates infection in many ways. And maybe what Vanessa was describing as that space of sitting with not knowing and that response that invites us to a different kind of posturing with crisis um, that feels like an invitation to stay with my son instead of rehabilitating him instead of trying to cure him instead of trying to fix him or put him on the neurotypical path as i'm learning that i've always done because i mask very well as a mildly autistic person it, it seems we're being invited to lose our way. And we need a politics that stays with that. And the minor gesture of being in thick and dense relationship with my son, whose strains um, are invitations to, um, or infectious invitations to remove myself from the sensorial bubble that has also germinated the crisis. I think, um, I think that's what I would call to over and over again mm. and speak to over and over again. It's prophecy for me. Mm. I'll offer you a little vignette. Um, it's a profane vignette or it come from a profane place. Understanding, of course, that the word profane actually means nothing more than the place in front of the altar or the place in the proto-sacred place. Mm. I was asked, I mean, routinely during my death trade days and very frequently in forums like this thereafter, whether I found that people who had a religious or spiritual practice or orientation had by definition a better time of it when they were dying. The assumption of the question was, how could they not? And the, the following assumption, obviously, was anyone who was bereft of such an orientation would, by definition, have a harder time of it. The understanding being then there, there must be something about just having anything to go by, some kind of allegation of a star chart that you tore out of the back of the, the National Geographic or something will somehow do you in good stead. 
And I thought about this long and hard, you know, before I answered. And uh, my answer really has no reason to change since it first dawned on me that uh, the answer is no. I mean, across the board, no. No, no worse necessarily, but maybe. Why? This is why. Most of the orientations that uh, the fixed orientations, let's call them, the disciplined orientations to, to life, to practice, to contemplation and so on, that those particular people brought were crafted with no reference ongoingly to the realities of dying or of death. Mm -hmm. So you realize they were taken out as a kind of inadvertent insurance policy against the vagaries and the, uh, the smithereens of dying. And lo and behold, when they come, when they're in the saddle, so to speak, uh, nothing looks like it did when they were believers. Nothing looks like it did when the convictions were upon them. Mm. And they're cut adrift from them because they're simply not workable. There's a kind of um, overarching cognitive dissonance between the convictions and the claim that dying lays upon them. And as a result of that, suffered unduly, mm -hmm. simply as a consequence of having been, and I'll use this term advisedly, wrong with their whole contemplative lives, which is not an ending you wish, wish upon anyone. But it's what I saw fairly routinely. I, I've noticed that one of the things that sort of floats through a lot of the literature is the obligation to be hopeful. So I just, uh, I just I wonder about that for a moment, and then it turn it back over to y'all. You know Hope has got a very good PR firm working for it. Of course it does. And it's very hard for people to challenge the mandate of Hope inherently. And so, as you may be alerted to, if you looked at DIYs in particular, I thought it was fairly important to wonder at least about the consequences of being hopeful when you're dying anyway. That's the caveat, when you're dying anyway. So, of course, as I said earlier, all these people were dying anyway, and they were obliged by the people around them, including the lunatic cheerleading brigade known as their families, to maintain a degree of hopefulness just in principle, that apparently it just was good for you to be hopeful. And apparently all of the literature indicates that hopeful people have better outcomes. I, I have no idea what better outcome means, when you're dying anyhow, and then you're dead. But that's what they contended. So I simply observed what being hopeful or the obligation to be hopeful did to dying people. And for what it's worth, it's a bit anecdotal, uh, but here it is. Um, almost by definition, it turned them away from their dying. At the very time when dying was pleading like, Be or like Grendel did for a way in. They, they turned away from it at the last possible moment, at the most grievous moment. And as a result, uh, died, hopefully. And um, we're talking right now, the four of us and others are listening. And I would dare say that, you know, apropos of the mandate of hope, we're not hopeful that we're talking right now. In fact, hope is absolutely not required in order for us to participate at all. We may talk about hope, but we don't have to be hopeful in order to do so. So hope is, is to, from what everything I've been able to see, almost ludicrously oversold as an enabler, as a facilitator, as a, as a Vaseline to make everything go down more readily. It reminds me of, of the advent of a mortgage, frankly. If you've ever been mortgaged, you know full well that the consequence is that a mortgage turns you away from what you could conceivably do with your money now because it's being siphoned off elsewhere. And for the uh, uh, likelihood, uh, the alleged likelihood, that you will be in full possession of that which you are making payments on in due course. And so there's a deferral ab about the present that hope, like mortgages, seems to require. But nobody's hopeful for the way it is. It doesn't seem big generalization, but worth considering, we seem to be hopeful for the way it isn't.
Thank you, Steve. And I think this is a great contribution to a, a conversation about hope that has been happening between Bio and Dugo and I mm. for a long time. And we talk about the different types of hope, naive hope, desolate hope, desperate hope, um, and the hope at the other end of despair as well. Uh, and the different chemistries. I'm I'm really interested in this insight that this is neurobiological, this is pheromonal, this is to do with um, all kinds of, uh, of, of uh, Re cat uh, reactions that are catalyzed in our metabolism, both our internal metabolism and our metabolism as a as a as a, a wider metabolism as part of of the planet. And one of the things that, again, going back to Chief Ninoa, um, it, that he <laughs> he really uh, hammers on is that it's, it's about the the role of teleology in hope and especially within modern societies. So how we place uh, hope in an idealization in the future. The, and then we decide in, in climate gatherings that it's a very good idea to spend a lot of time talking about that <laughs> rather than talking about the present, right? So we, we yeah. project hope into an image in the future that we try to convince others to um, agree to or to that this is the forward we want. And then we, we believe that we'll be able to plan for that without uh, having to look at the shit and the present without having to compost. So we skip the shit into hope as an escape um, from the present rather than figuring out how we can expand our collective capacity to um, and how to create a stomach actually mm, mm. to sit with what's um, good, bad, ugly, broken, and messed up right now. And without turning away, without feeling overwhelmed, without feeling immobilized, without throwing up, without throwing a tantrum. So, how do we sit with it and collectively compost something? How do we have a collective composting party and find the joy in it? Uh, and that's, I think, what um, Chief Nenoa may be referring to when he talks about uh, the hope is only in the weaving of relationships differently in the present, the repairing of relationships. But when we talk about relationships, we, we generally think about relationships between people. And it's very difficult to actually enlarge that, to think about our relationship with ourselves, with our bodies, with knowledge, with language. Um, with critique, <laughs> our relationship with things that are not um, with, with the invisible, right? our relationship with faith, our relationship with theology, our relationship with hope. So when I, when I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about weaving relationships differently, I'm thinking about not just between us uh, as the us, as in the anthropocentric us, but the us of the ineffable, too, and the us in the things that that tra traverse us or transverse us that come through us and I'm talking when I'm talking about the 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 shit is all the clutter that we carry uh that prevents us from being more open to have these things come through that might have different epiphanies that don't come from the human mind uh so figuring out a discipline and I think somebody well, like the, the discipline is 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 uh, has su surfaced for me as as a, an important thing in decluttering that space and and breaking the bubble, the sensorial bubble that uh, Bio talked about when he was talking about his son, in terms of inviting back uh, capacities that have been exiled by the bubble and by modernity itself, uh, in ways that can can prepare us better to do the difficult and um, frustrating, irritating work that needs to be done and finding comfort and the discomfort and finding joy in staying with the trouble, in, in staying with the struggle, in weathering storms, um, rather than find, trying to find an escape in an idealization of the future, and which is taking a lot of our time, a lot of resources, right? And, and, and moving as a way um, my my partner Renee talks about because we, we we usually talk about denials 
uh, denial of our entanglement, our complicity in harm, denial of sustainability and of the magnitude of the problem. And I think we are we're now moving from denial to deflection. I think everybody already, we can't turn away completely, but we can run, like we can not decide not to look at it, but but acknowledge its presence. So um, the ways that people deflect are usually uh, this escape into idealization. And it could be the idealization of a future of, of a group of people who are going to save us or of an authority that is going to come in and sort out the problem or um, even a return to a specific point in time. Uh, but staying where reality is really difficult. So I think educationally, that's the place to start from. How do we expand our capacity? to sit with what's difficult without feeling immobilized, overwhelmed, or demanding quick fixes or to be rescued from the discomfort. Thanks, Vanessa. I'm just noticing the sense that maybe what's starting to happen in this conversation is we start to bring things to be composted. So Stephen's brought us hope and said, you know, it's time to put this onto the compost heap. And Vanessa's brought us the future and said, I think it's time for us to put this onto the, the compost heap. And that's one that I, I really feel I'm writing something that I've been carrying around for a couple of years that it's time to write now that's called Instead of the Future, because I got so tired of being invited into these well-intended spaces in which we were convened to participate in a process of envisioning a future where we had built a sustainable world and then you know back casting from it or whatever and um apart from anything else one of the things that i found myself needing to say was i think when the people who are generally brought together in those rooms to gather around the future i think when the invitation is made to us to do that you know beautiful imagining of the future I, part of what's going on is that the future offers us refuge from what it would cost to actually imagine the present, to inhabit the present whilst imagining the implications of my life for so many people who mm -hmm. are entangled with the things that make my life possible. Mm -hmm. And over time, I've heard you, Vanessa, and others from the Decolonial Futures Collective speak about presently unimaginable futures. And it took me a long time that really to sink in and like feel what it was that I was hearing. And the way that it began to make sense for me was the futures, like the, the worlds that are worth living for in the times to come presently unimaginable because in order for them to become imaginable we have to become other than who and how we are just now so what's called for is not us as we are just now to gather together and exercise some imaginative projection of willpower to create that future worth having it's actually for us to be stripped made vulnerable composted you know, brought to the place where we have a chance of being changed, of being called into question, of losing enough that we might be able to see things that we can't see from where we're starting from just now. I wonder if it's time, Peter, for us to, to bring you back in and start to bring in questions from those who are with us. Right. Um, so let there be light in the stoa. Everyone can uh, turn on their, their camera now uh, and I'll unpin the, the videos. And if you have any questions, um, we'll put in the chat uh, instead of the raise hand feature and I'll call on you and you can ask your question uh, to the panel. Um, and we have a question uh, from Jay. Jay, would you, uh, about the secular sacred, um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Jay, are you still in the room with us? If not, we'll move 
Um, Beverly, Beverly, you had a you had a question. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for this very stimulating conversation. I'm so grateful for all the information and imaginations that are in the space. My question is um, about artists, healers, inventors, gardeners, and so many others who are already engaged in the work of imagining the new present, including the more than human, um, and trying to create mycelial connections that are needed to travel through this very challenging threshold. None of us know, none of us know what we are traveling through or but we are attempting, I think, to have um, kind and loving relationships as we move through it and to bridge across chasms that seem impassable. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of how that plays in your imaginations. Thank you. Thanks, Beverly. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. uh, just some first things that were coming up for me that um, oh, one of the things that I have associated over time with why I've been drawn to spend a lot of time working with people who get to call themselves artists is that capacity for acting without having to know how the story ends acting without having to make everything fit into clear binary categories tends to be something i mean lewis hyde said there is this connection between the trickster as the kind of transcultural um archetype and the role of the artist as it has existed in modern societies that the artists have kind of kept a refuge for that um trickster ability to stay with ambiguity and not be threatened by it um and that becomes more important like the other bit that i got from hyde's trickster book was the sense that in in times of cultural stability trickster is kind of a low status character within a pantheon within a cosmology he's somewhere between you know a nuisance and a source of entertainment but in moments where the old order cannot hold the high gods have nothing to offer because they are the embodiments of an order that may have served us and given us beautiful things while it worked but if what's at stake now is the end of that then the things that they can do don't help and it's the trickster figure who is able to turn the fall into slapstick into comedy into the opportunity to take it all less seriously than the high gods need us to take it and that there may be some connection between that and the roles that those of us who you know get to show up some of the time as artists are invited to play in times when things are making less and less sense to everybody and everybody's having to navigate more ambiguity and confusion and precarity than has been the norm in quieter times. Thank you, Dugo. I, I think I will also compliment and uh, thank you, Beverly, too, for the comment slash question. Um, I work with a, a collective that involves artists, too, and one of the things we faced when uh, carrying out an inquiry about responsibility in the arts and education is that there's a very strong imprint of the avant-garde in the culture of the arts. And that imprint of the avant-garde um, <clears throat> can yet in a way, in the way of us, uh, in the way of the inquiry too. So the, the desire to be the ones leading the way is actually a modern colonial desire. So one of the things that we have agreed uh, between ourselves just for our inquiry is that anytime that we think we're already doing it, the most responsible thing to do is to doubt it and say that the, the process is much deeper than that. And that uh, and to identify that desire to be at the avant-garde or at the forefront or the ones who are already 
giving birth to something and take a step, take several steps back and say that desire itself is problematic. But that's that's something we do <laughs> internally. Uh, and we, we have tried to share this with other collectives and that's a difficult one for other people that, that we found that other people find it difficult uh, also to relate to. Thank you. This is gonna, a comment that comes from somebody who's, um as a musical act that I inflict upon the unsuspecting public from time to time when we can get out. <laughs> and um, I used to be fairly persuaded that the fundament of the artistic enterprise was reflective. That is to say that, uh, you know, our principal activity is to hold some kind of flawed mirror up to the proceedings mm. with the understanding that somehow just the naked truth would do. <laughs> And I've come either more refined or less uh, concerted as I've gotten older. And for what it's worth, this is what's come to me instead. Maybe the artistic function, maybe particularly in a time of trouble, is more prismatic than it is reflective. By which I mean that it could be that our, our responsibility, not easily borne, by the way, is to take whatever we're capable of, you know, the, the God-givenness of our capacities, and have the culture as it is pass through them such that the constituent parts of the culture become available to the culture. In order to do that, it seems that the fundamental obligation is to see to it that you stand by, I think it was Cicero, who said something in the order of, uh, my, my job is to live in such a way that nothing human is foreign to me. And which is to say, you have to occupy a lot of places that are deeply unbecoming and deeply otherwise, in order that uh, the old order of dividing and conquering itself is divided and conquered. And, and um, you can be relied upon simply by your willingness to have the culture continue to iterate itself through your work, such that uh, the constituent parts on the other side are much more available than they were before you undertook your work. Work being understood, by the way, as the thing that you're least inclined to do, probably. Mm -hmm. um, probably I'll just add this, that if you trace if you run a line, a squiggly, uncertain, definitely not confident line between these um, explorations, and especially um, what I'd been saying about um, errancy and getting lost and finding oneself differently, um, you this might not be surprising to hear that. I'm morbidly interested in the zombie. <laughs> you might know a little bit about the zombie and its histories in black culture and in Haiti and 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 the slave plantation. Um, the zombie became this figure, especially when it was co-opted by Hollywood, of imperial anxieties about what wasn't supposed, what the body wasn't supposed to look like, right? And I've been really attracted to the zombie as a milieu instead of just a figure, an atomic figure in the distance as a territory of acting with hidden lives, right? Secret lives. Um, uh, the way it's painted, it's, you know, if you've watched any of those horrible shows, dead shows, um, uh, the zombie is zombie has no secrets. The zombie is available for scrutiny. The, the zombie has no agency. But the original stories told about the zombie, um, as, as frightening as they are to modern ears, were about the secret intelligences of a world that is beyond our knowing, the non-legibility, the non, what did Vanessa call it a while ago? The, uh, in, an, a world beyond imaginary, um, modern imaginaries, right? I think art is attracted to uh, to the zombie today, right? To the secret lives of worlds beyond our ken. Um, that our work is to sit around cracks, to sit around openings, 
to treat them as invitations, that the open jaw of the monster represents some kind of opportunity to rekindle or to shapeshift ourselves. And that art, like this diffractive exercise that Stephen is, is, is articulating, more than reflecting something that reflects or uh, coddles or uh, comforts our anticipations about the next, we are being invited to lose our way. So art without a, uh, on aesthetics without subjects or without situated simple objects is what my work is leaning into and what the villages that I'm part of is leaning in, are leaning into as well. Yeah. Uh, we might have time for one more question. Uh, Holly, you had a question on silence. Holly, you still here? Yep, sorry, I just was on mute. Um, Hi, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, I just have so much respect and it's such an honor to, to be here and to be receiving um, just your your wisdom and your energy. And when Stephen was speaking, it really just moved me. Um, and so I just really, really thank you for your honest and, and kind words. Um, I, I had, I overheard myself say something the other day and I, I was really surprised by it, which was, um, I am most relaxed in silence. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that if I am creating anything of artistic merit, that it comes from the silence. Like I have to go into the silence first. And it also has to come from a place of relaxation. Like I can't be tense. And so I guess I'm just sort of wondering um, this invitation sort of into silence when did silence become so daunting and, and scary? And um, what do you think it will kind of take for us to become more intimate with silence? <laughs> Good practice. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just about to quickly say that it seems the only way to really respond to that is, is to offer a non-response <laughs> that almost embodies the intelligence of the question. Like something about the question just makes me want to keep quiet mm -hmm. and not offer words that might ruin it. I'll, yeah. I'll risk, I'll I'll risk your validation. Please, please, brother, just, do. Just imagine the following. When we're continually obliged by obligations to be hopeful and positive and forward-looking, to continue to generate questions that begin with, how do you, or where do you, the, the stillness and the silence is an early and oftentimes permanent casualty of that kind of inquiry. The, the obligation to somehow formulate the plan to occupy a position on all matters. Things of this kind are very disquieting, I think, and not just for the person who's on the receiving end of the question or the demand, but on the generating end as well. And, and the you know, legions of witnesses who are watching, you know, many of us in these circumstances flail about uh, trying to cover the waterfront when there's no real f obligation to do so. I'm remembering how often Ivan Illich wrote or spoke about silence in one of his early talks. He said, to learn a language and only learn its words and not its silences is an incredibly violent thing. And in the early 1980s in Germany, he was involved with activists who were protesting against the American nuclear missiles that were being brought into Germany. And he wrote a very short thing, just a few lines on a, a flyer that was handed out at demonstrations. 
that was just affirming silence as the only proper response to an abomination that to enter into reasoned dialogue and debate over a thing like nuclear weapons was to make a category error and so what they did instead was simply to stand silently on the streets of these small towns where the missiles were being brought through and stand there as an act of visible witness mm -hmm. and there's one other text called silence is a commons where he says i think the loudspeaker may be the most you know the most overlooked violation among the technologies that have changed what it's like to be in the world in recent generations because he said you know until my grandfather's time most of the words that you heard in your lifetime were spoken by someone who knew you existed Mm -hmm. Today, there is none of us for whom that is true. Most of the words we hear in our lifetimes come to us through, not through live encounters on screens like that. I think the most articulative silences may not be re a retreat. Hmm. Hmm. there might have been some um wi-fi connection uh, um yeah. but uh, uh that was the... transversal and beautiful yes i think my only response to this is silence which is what i when i heard everybody that's uh yeah. that was the necessity right um i wish we had a whole day so that we could pace this in a way that allowed for us to be um digesting things as well as engaging and i think uh, educationally too um we, we tended to think about education as as, as feeding information and today that's the, the we are overfed <laughs> all the time and there's no time for digestion so i've been talking about an education that is probiotic and prebiotic and rather than the meal um itself but that that requires uh, silence so thank you for that question maybe we could make the invitation to each other that when we leave this call we each spend even if it's just a minute or two before we go on to whatever else is waiting for us and give ourselves the gift of silence after all of the words that have been shared in this time together Just before we do that, and since we're leaving soon, I wanted to voice gratitude for for being with you guys today. It, it was it was silencing and humbling. So, thank you. Mm. feels like a nice place to uh, close off today's session. Um, so, uh, Bio, Stephen, Vanessa, uh, Gold, thank you so much for coming to Stoa today, echoing uh, Bio's gratitude. Um, do check out the Dugold's uh, new book, uh, At Work in the Ruins. And uh, for those of you who are new to the STOA, uh, this video will be posted on the STOA's YouTube channel, uh, which I'll put in the chat. Um, and you can RSVP to the uh, upcoming events. Uh, I put some in the chat so you can get an idea of what's coming up. Uh, and I'm actually going to take in uh, Helen, uh, who's here. And we have a lovely practice called Collective Presencing uh, in the STOA's Wisdom Gym. Uh, so Helen, would you like to unmute yourself and... Uh, just to give an idea of what people can expect with that. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling a lot of inner silence from uh, from 
this this conversation a lot of gratitude for for the the messiness and the intensity and the not knowing and the discomfort and uh the uh pm <laughs> and um and these are all basically uh things that we learn to sit with in the practice of collective presencing uh just a, uh, a a collective practice that we that is part of the regular stoa offering uh platform every well it's at uh on tuesdays in the middle of the american night and european morning and on uh fridays either at midday or um 2 p.m it's not no it's 8 8 a.m 8 or 2 uh, or midday um, Eastern time. So, but all of the times are 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 on the Stowe website. It's a really great opportunity to come together collectively and sit with the not knowing, with the um, inability to answer how do you and <laughs> and when do you questions and um generally come into the the intimacy of of silence and a little bit more comfortable comfort with with the failure to get it right every time uh and so just as a as a as a final offering um i'd like to if i can find my beta ring us out oh dear my my desk is in a mess yeah there we go Everyone, thank you so much thank for so much. Thank you.